This is Winchester Academy. We are so glad to be here tonight, not only because you've asked us to speak about Increase Lapham, whom we love, but because your town is so wonderful. I've only been here a few hours, and I'm kind of hooked on the place. I really <laughs> like it here. I want to come back. And anyway, it's very nice. Thank you. Thanks for asking us. All right. So we're going to talk, Paul and I, about Increase Lapham. Came here in 1836, died in 1875, and had a huge impact on Wisconsin. And why is he important? Well, all of these things which are listed up here are important. His um, first scientific paper, um, the first book about, first book published in Wisconsin in 1844, the first book published in Wisconsin when it was still, it was a, still a territory, and uh, his major survey of the Indian mounds. If you know anything about him, you probably already know that he did the survey of the Indian mounds published in 1855. He was a founder of major cultural institutions and so on. But one of the things that I think is, I mean, well, a way to summarize this is that he was an early and extraordinary able naturalist in very many areas of the field. It was many fields at the time. He was good at connecting his knowledge not only to people who were scientists in other parts of the world, but to the people here in Wisconsin who needed this information. So he was not just a scientist for other scientists. He was a scientist, uh, a naturalist for the people of Wisconsin. That was very important to him, that his knowledge be accessible and useful. Yeah. Yeah. This is my husband. This is my manager. <laughs> Increase Lapham was born in. It's still quiet. What? Do I have it on upside down? You know what? Your collar is actually blocked. Well, we'll try that. <laughs> Again, he says it's good. Okay. All right. He was born in New York State. He was born to a large Quaker family to whom education was very important. That doesn't mean that he and his large number of brothers and sisters got to go to school because there weren't very many schools because they traveled around up and down the Erie Canal, back and forth on the Erie Canal, and there were not many schools in those days for them to go to, but these became educated people, all the people in the Lapham family, the children, because the mother was a very good teacher and she taught the children to read and it was just as important to her that the girls read and study as it was to the boys. So it was a very interesting family um, to whom uh, education was really the key to almost everything. Um, they were not, there was not just a family that were, were instructors for Increase Lapham on the Erie Canal, but the canal contractors and, and the engineers on the canal um, the people that his father worked with, he was a co contractor on the Erie Canal. His older brother Darius immediately worked on the canal as soon as he was old enough. But the, all the canal men, and they were mostly men, were, were usually self-taught engineers, but they were frequently Quakers and frequently naturalists. So there was a kind of community of people who were studying 
the natural world and who were reading and who shared books with the Laphams. They didn't have much money, but, but uh, Increase was early on recognized as a boy with extraordinary talent. So the, a lot of these engineers sort of took him under their wings and they, and they um, taught him and gave him opportunities. Now the Erie Canal was important in, in Increase Lapham's life and the Erie Canal was begun by New York State in 1817. This is a state um, project and completed in 1825. And it connected, essentially, the New York and the harbors on the eastern seaboard to the Great Lakes and opened up the center of the country. So the Erie Canal is this all the way through the state of New York. And Increase was born in Palmyra, um, but they lived in almost all of these cities ending in Lockport, where the canal ended. Um, and some of the most interesting and important construction happened in Lockport, where the canal went through the other side of the Niagara Escarpment, which is, is something we all know from um, Wisconsin, where it goes through around, uh, it, well, it's the other side of the basin of the Great Lakes. Paul will talk about that better than I will. Um, <laughs> So the Erie Canal was really important to Lapham and his early um, upbringing. Here's a, I love this slide. This is the goofiest picture of a, a canal crane that had been redesigned by a man named Orange Dibble. Isn't that a nice name? Orange Dibble. Um, and it, Increase was fascinated. He drew by this crane and by its improvements. He was interested not only in the natural world, but by the engineering of the canal and uh, things like the, uh, um, the machinery on the canal. And he several times drew this uh, improvement on the uh, cranes. And this is the, uh, this is a, uh, I started to say shot like it's a photograph. This is, um, oops, this is the uh, canal as it was going through um, the, the deep cut at Lockport, going through the Niagara Escarpment edge at Lockport before it got to Buffalo, New York. Anyway, this is where Increase Lapham began his work life as a young boy, probably just chipping rocks um, and, and looking at the fossils he saw in this limestone. Later he said, and this quotation we think is very important, later he said that it was the specimens he found in the canal at Lockport. That's where he learned to be an observer of the natural world. And he was that his whole life. This is what, something he said at the end of his life about how he came to be increased lap. Some of his earliest work and some of his most, I think some of his most enjoyable work was at Shipping Port in Kentucky. Now, after the Erie Canal was finished, his father had to, his job was no longer on the canal, but he was a canal man. So he went to work on the Shipping Port Canal, um, the, or the Louisville and Portland Canal down in in Louisville, Kentucky. And the family split up. The mother was just having another, I think the 10th or 11th child. So she stayed in Lockport with the youngest children. Darius, the older brother, went on to work at the Welland Canal. And Increase and his father went down to Kentucky. It was in Kentucky that he began some of his most important work. He began, first of all, I think he began to be a writer when he was at uh, Lockport. He began to keep a journal. He began to write letters to his brother Darius, who was not living in the house anymore. But the brother Darius was really important to him. So these letters between Darius and Increase were, in a way, Darius and Increase, more importantly Increase, learning how to think like um, 
like a scientist, like a good naturalist. So um, the letters were important, his journals were important. He began a journal sort of sporadically. Usually kids begin journals when they're, uh, when they're like 15 or 16, and they start out kind of gung-ho, and then it peters out in a week or two. With increased lap it was the opposite. It started out slow, and then it became something he did every day for much of the rest of his life, was to keep a journal. And these were not journals about his feelings or, or that kind of thing, but about what he saw in the world around him, what birds he saw, what, what plants he saw, whether or not they could find the cow out by the, uh, that had wandered away. I mean, it was, and who, what work they were doing on the canal. It was about his observations of the world around him. And it was also kind of funny, too. I love his early journals. He also published a, an article, a description of Louisville in a very well-known scientific journal, Silliman's Journal. He didn't know, Benjamin Silliman didn't realize that he'd accepted an article from a 16-year-old boy. But when he did, he wrote back and said, you're going to be just fine, kid. He didn't say it exactly. Like that. He worked in Columbus. He worked in Portland, um, Portsmouth, Ohio, too. But in Columbus, Increase, who was a very young man, he was in his early, by then early 20s, he worked with all the important naturalists and canal people in Ohio in one building in, at the Ohio State House. It was an amazing job. He was the secretary of the Ohio Canal Commission, and he met all these wonderful people, many of whom he corresponded with for years, like J.P. Kirtland and some of the others. Um, and so this was an important, and he also met Byron Kilborn. Byron Kilborn, at this point, was a, a, a canal man, an entrepreneur. He was on his way to Wisconsin to work for Micaja Williams, and they were going to make some money in the new territory of Wisconsin. So um, Increase Lapham ultimately, because of his connection with Byron Kilborn, came to Wisconsin unwillingly. <laughs> I hate, I sort of don't like it that he didn't really want to come to Wisconsin, but I had to admit it and write it. He wanted, he had connections in Ohio. His family was there. He had made connections with the, um, he, was, he was hoping to work on the Ohio State Geological Survey, which he had helped plan. He, would, he had been connected with some wonderful botanists, and he was working with them. So, I mean, there were, he had all kinds of connections in Ohio. And it had been his home. His family had a farm there. And he didn't want to leave, but it was the only job offer he got. And he lost his job at the Ohio Canal, Canal Commission because he was a Whig, and, they, and all the Whigs lost their office, lost their, their jobs because the Democrats came into power. So he had, to, he had said he would take this job with with Byron Kilborn, and he, reluct he tried to get other jobs in Ohio and to get somebody else to take the place of him to go to Wisconsin, but he didn't, and he was an honorable man, or boy, or whatever he was, and he went to Wisconsin, and to his credit, as soon as he got to Wisconsin, he said, I am home, and I love that. <laughs> Paul's going to talk to you at this point. We, we change places from time to time. Can you hear me? Now can you hear me? <laughs> uh -oh. How's that? Better? Still can? Okay. Thank you. Well, I, I feel like increased lap of being here because this is his habitat. Uh, he would be in front of a group of people in an organization that he helped found in Milwaukee called the Milwaukee Lyceum. And they had a lecture series throughout the winter. And while you had these nice lights, they would have had lamps. 
probably in a church basement, but that didn't that that didn't change the nature of this. Uh, we would be here, and he would be speaking sometimes for two hours uh, about geology or botany or whatever. So it's it's a privilege to be here, and, uh, and like Martha, uh, this is an impressive crowd. And we're happy to be here. So in order to get to Milwaukee which is 400 miles from where he started by the Crow's flight. He would have, first he went to, uh, from Columbus to Cincinnati to say goodbye to friends and relatives. And then by stage, he went back to Columbus. And by stage, he went to Sandusky. And there he boarded a steamer. And the steamer went to Cleveland. And he got off and boarded another steamer. And that steamer went up the St. Clair River, past Detroit, into Lake Huron, all the way north to Mackinac Island, and then docked there a little bit. And so he got off the boat and walked into the, to the village at Mackinac Island because he wanted to see if he could talk to Henry Schoolcraft, uh, who was an even earlier scientist in the wilderness, but Henry was on a field trip, and so Increase left a note on his door, got back on the steamer, and here they're steaming south on Lake Michigan, but on the Michigan side. And they got down to the bottom of the lake and made the U-turn, and they got up to Chicago, and Increase got off again at Chicago and took the lay of the land and decided that he would make the last 90 miles to Milwaukee. And so he did, and the trip was for 400 miles, uh, about four weeks long. <laughs> and he, he enjoyed it very much. And he got off at Milwaukee. The steamer had to dock at the mouth of the Milwaukee River because the Milwaukee River was then blocked by a sandbar that was only about three feet deep and rowboats came out to the steamer and downloaded it, took off the uh, luggage and the, and the goods and the passengers, and took them upstream to the Milwaukee River. Because he worked for Kilbourne, he got off on the left side. If he'd gotten a job with Juno, he might have gotten off on the right side. But Juno was the first settler in Milwaukee, and Kilbourne was later, and for a time they were uh, very energetic rivals. Kilburn wanted his city to be important. Juno had already established a certain amount of importance. And uh, this went on uh, for several years until finally uh, the three villages of Milwaukee, including one on the south, on, on Milwaukee's south side, joined together to form a single city called Milwaukee in the 1840s. But before that, they had a a nasty little controversy called the Bridge War, in which uh, some people on the west side drew up a cannon and aimed it at the east side because they didn't want the bridge that the east side was building to the west side. Uh, have we changed at all? <laughs> so, make up your own mind. So, anyway, when he got to Milwaukee, um, Oh, it's the next. Gotta go this way. Yeah. No, go past that one. Go past it. Yeah. This is the map of Milwaukee that Increase carried on the steamboat. It was Byron Kilbourne's map. Yeah. And it was Byron Kilbourne's promotion of what he wanted Milwaukee to be. It had nothing to do with what was actually on the ground. <laughs> and if you notice, there were more people over here that Kilburn forgot to put on because that was Juno Town. So he lives on the west side. It's called Kilburn Town. And he gets off at Juno, roughly Juno Avenue, which is called where Kilburn had a house, but it wasn't Juno Avenue yet. There were 50 houses in Milwaukee, some of them just huts, some of them log cabins, a few of them. <coughs> Uh, frame houses, so maybe 50 houses of new settlers, and probably just as many wigwams 
in the Menominee Valley, mm -hmm. where the Menominee and the Potawatomi were still harvesting wild rice. So that's, he has come from Ohio to the very frontier of the United States expansion. And he's one of the first settlers in the new city of Milwaukee. It's late to form because Wisconsin hasn't, hasn't been open to settlement uh, until two things happened. The Erie Canal opens, and secondly, the Black Hawk War ends. And when the Black Hawk War ends, the place is opened up for a land market and the people are coming through the canal and down the Great Lakes and they're flocking to the east side of Milwaukee. There is a settlement of, of people, of, of Europeans in, in Wisconsin and they're the southwestern Wisconsin <laughs> miners who have come up from Kentucky, the Carolinas, Tennessee and the like, and Missouri and they're mining lead and eventually they'll mine zinc too. But they've got the mines open. And they're the big settlers here, and they were one of the causes of the Black Hawk War. Mm -hmm. And of course, poor Black Hawk lost, and uh, the war ended, the miners came back, and a great migration of mostly New Yorkers came into Wisconsin. The first major settlement of eastern Wisconsin was by New York, New York Yankees. Uh, they still call them that. No. <laughs> And he came here at Byron Kilburn's request to be the chief engineer of the Milwaukee and Rock River Canal. And it was Kilburn's dream that a canal start at Milwaukee on the Menominee River and go westward through Ozaukee County to about Pewaukee near the Fox River and then north of uh, Pewaukee Lake here and through the lake country of Waukesha County where it would pick up the Bark River at uh, the Namabin Lakes in western Waukesha County and follow the Bark River down to uh, Fort Atkinson on the Rock River. That would be the Milwaukee and Rock River Canal and it increased immediately went into the field with survey equipment and he found this route and drew this map. And it was Kilburn's dream that when the canal was built, 40 feet wide and eight feet deep throughout this area, uh, following other streams that already existed, this would be the way that the miners of southwestern Wisconsin would get their lead to the East Coast markets. They were already floating their lead down the Wisconsin River and down the Mississippi River to New Orleans. But to get to, this, to the really high demand places on the East Coast, they then had to go through the Gulf of Mexico and up the East Coast. This would save so much money and so much travel that they could get the lead out uh, on this wonderful canal and ship it through the Great Lakes and the Erie Canal to Boston to Philadelphia, to New York, to the big industries of the East, and even to Europe. Uh, and one of the first, the second book uh, published in Milwaukee was Lappin's report on this canal, uh, which uh, was really a series of articles that ran in the then Milwaukee Sentinel and Milwaukee Advertiser, the two first newspapers of Milwaukee, and it described the benefits of this. It was never built. Um, by the time that they managed to get the financing and the plans done, everybody realized their railroads would do the job faster and cheaper. And the canal was abandoned, and uh, that didn't bother Kilburn at all, because he had as much stake in the railroads as he did in the canal. So that was he, he was, he was ahead of us all. Okay. This is the canal in Milwaukee. A piece of the canal was built. And this is the North Avenue Dam. This is about the 1880s. 
Um, this is the North Avenue Dam. They built the dam, Kilburn and Lapham, uh, supervised the construction of this dam. They blocked the Milwaukee River just north of Juneau Avenue, which would be about here. And it, the mill race, or the canal, then took off here. And it attracted, through its power and its supply of water, all of this industry in Pioneer, Milwaukee. And Kilburn's house is right in this area. Mm -hmm. So Kilburn got his dream. Tanneries, breweries, machine shops, they took the water power, they took the water usage, and it became the industrial birth of the, what became the manufacturing colossus of Milwaukee in the, 20, in the 19th and 20th centuries. This canal still exists. Uh, it fell out of use about 1880 when we were able to import enough coal to power steam engines to do the work that the water was doing, so everybody converted to fossil fuels. I haven't had a thing to say about fossil fuels. And, uh, and you can see that that has already happened because here's the smoke, here's the air pollution. And so they filled this canal in with rock and rubble and urban waste and paved it now call it Commerce Street, and you can drive on it. It's still there. Do you, do you know Milwaukee enough to know about Commerce Street? Because I drive it a lot. It's, it's a really nice curvy road right next to the river. So. Here comes Martha. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Increase Lapham met. Ann Alcott, apparently on the street, uh, as she was walking to see her sister, they lived near each other, uh, her, she was visiting her sister from, she was from Marshall, Michigan, her sister had already moved to Milwaukee, and they met on the street and they began talking, and this was in June of 1838, and there's not much in Increase's journal or in his letters, for that whole summer, he's pretty silent, and then he's married. <laughs> now, that, no, actually, what they do first is they go to Mil they they get on a steamboat and they go take that that whole trip down around the lake again, and they go back up to Marshall, Michigan, where they get off the steamboat and they go to see his mo her mother to ask her permission. Um, is it okay if uh, Anne marries increase? Lapham, and she said, I think the sentence she said was, I can't think of any objection. And it was just, you know, not real. But anyway, she ended up loving Increase, and they ended up having probably one of the best marriages I ever read about. She was a wonderfully well-educated woman from Schenectady, New York, and um, um, she too valued education and science, and she was a wonderful wife for Increase La Lapham. Um, I think this is a particularly unflattering photograph of her, but I mean, it's not a photograph. I don't know what it is, actually. It must be a photograph. Uh, but Increase looks pretty good, doesn't he, in yeah. this one? And um, in 1848, he began, I think it was 48. No, it was, it was later than that. He began to build right next to his frame house, um, a rental building, good Milwaukeean that he'd become. And this is at, when it was at the end of its life, but in the back on the second floor of this building, he had, um, I guess you would call it a, a studio. What do, you, what do we call that? A studio? Yeah, studio, laboratory, laboratory study, library. study. It was where he put all his stuff and all those specimens of rocks and plants and and all his very well organized letters, which he filed carefully by date and subject, and all his papers and his books. Um, and he also had a bookshelf built out of the native walnut from that area that was something like 16 feet long. It still exists, not much still exists. But this is in the Milwaukee County Historical Society, and it's on the second floor, it, and they let you go up and pet it. 
<laughs> it's a beautiful, unbelievably huge structure with glass fronted cabinets and it's very beautiful. So you can go up there and take a look at it. Should have it in the slides. Increase Lapham was a, a lot of different things, but one of the best things he was was a botanist. He was a fantastic botanist. He uh, collected plants when he was in Ohio, Kentucky, and exchanged specimens with men like Aza Gray from the East, C.W. Short down in Kentucky, um, John Torrey in New York. All of these people, their man in the West was in Crease Lapham. If they wanted specimens of the plants that were to be found on the frontier, what um, Increase Lapham was about at that time as far west as they could get. So they, he sent beautifully prepared specimens, dried and pressed, back to New York. One of my favorite parts of doing the research for this book was one time I went to the Milwaukee Public Museum and asked to see their um, Increase Lapham plant specimens. There weren't a huge number up there, but there were quite a f there were about six or eight. And and I asked the botanist to show me all the plant specimens for one plant, including increased lapums. So that he laid out on this big table something like 16 or 18 plant specimens from all different eras, from different people. It was the same plant. It was an aster of some kind. I don't remember which one. But they were all laid out there, and they were, and I was looking at the one for lapum, and I kept thinking, Am I crazy, or is this one just particularly beautiful? And it, and it is particularly beautiful. He would lay out these plant specimens in a very artistic and clear way so that people could see the roots of the plant, the, the, the stems of the plant, how, the leaves, all aspects of the plant were very clearly displayed. And I asked the botanist, of all of these specimens, which one would you most want to look at in order to understand that plant? And he surprised himself because he said, I guess it's Lapham's. It's, and it was the oldest one there. But it, it was also the most beautiful and the most clear specimen there. Many of his specimens still exist at the herbarium in Madison, and we've gotten to go look at him. And oddly enough, a lot of his things were ruined in the Science Hall fire. Um, of 1883, but his plants were not there. So the most fragile of his, of his specimens, the plants, still exist, which I think is kind of wonderful. Um, the Antiquities of Wisconsin is, is really his masterwork, is the greatest work that he did. He went around, beginning in the 1850s, after he'd gotten a a kind of contract from the American Antiquities Association in Worcester, Massachusetts. They agreed to pay him, not pay him, but to advance him $500 to hire a wagon and a boy and pay for rooms to go around the state and look at the Indian mounds of Wisconsin. Um, and he did that for five, three years and did amazing work. I mean, we could talk all night about this, and I'm, but one of the things I just want to say to you is that recently my husband Jim and I um, were doing some work um, on a, trying to save a bluff and some oak trees in Glendale where we live. And this is actually right about a mile and a half from where, not even a mile and a half, but it's, it's a, a blocks from where I live on the Milwaukee River, near the Milwaukee River. And one of the things, and the, the piece of land we we're trying to save was some of this bluff right here. And some trees that are now not as old as this, this was in 1850, but, well, they might be as old as this, we're just not sure. But one of the things we ended up doing, I didn't do it, but. Jim and his friend Peter did, was measure, is it this one, Jim? Middle of the page. Oh, oh this one? So just to the right of this. Okay. There, right. One of these Indian mounds still exists partially. The rest of them are gone. 
But one of the things that they did, Jim and Peter, was to measure this dis distance from here to here on a Google map. And it was complicated, but they did that. And then they used a scale, they scaled this map and figured out, well, what was Increase Lapham saying that this distance would have been from there to the riverbank? And in both cases, it turned out to be 707 feet. And so, I mean, one of the, I mean, Increase Lapham was not always perfectly accurate in his measurements, but sometimes he got it exactly right. And, and this was not very far from his home. This was in Milwaukee. He probably was able to spend some time there, and, and maybe it wasn't, it was fairly decent weather, too. But uh, um, his, his Antiquities of Wisconsin is, in some cases, the only information we have about Indian man mounds, which are lost forever. And um, there's a wonderful reproduction copy of this published by the University of Wisconsin Press. And it's not very expensive, and it's something, boy, everybody, every household ought to have one. Mm -hmm. It's an, an amazingly beautiful reproduction um, of this amazing Wisconsin work, which I'm not going to talk anymore about because I can't. <laughs> but Paul is going to talk to you about increases in maps. One of the ways Increase made a living after he quit being a canal engineer, which was early in his career in Milwaukee, uh, was to be a map maker. He would sell maps of Wisconsin and maps of Milwaukee and maps of neighborhoods. Uh, this is his most, oh, I didn't turn it on. Do I need to repeat that or did you hear it? But we're okay? Yeah. But better now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So he, uh, he drafted this map. This is his most popular map. And it is, uh, it's a sectional map. That is, it's divided into the sections of, uh, of the townships of, of Milwaukee, the sections and, of Wisconsin. And it, uh, but but this, this is the base map, except on this base map, he's also put these, these sweeping lines Oops, sorry. Am I? I don't know if it's there we go. Yeah. These lines, yeah. Yeah. these are isothermic lines. Oh. They show temperature variations as you go inland, and they show the seasons. So they show that the temperature uh, is not evenly distributed, and the only explanation come to was that they were being affected by Lake Superior and Lake Michigan. So when you hear a forecast of cooler near the lake, Increase was one of the first to notice that. Mm -hmm. And it may have, he may have been the first, and this map is certainly the first attempt to show it on a scale of, that he actually had evidence for. He was a meteorologist at Wisconsin's first. He lived his home in Milwaukee was a block and a half west of the Milwaukee River, and it was wild land when he settled there. So right at the bank of the Milwaukee River on land he probably did not own. He maintained as modern a weather station as you could at the time. He measured wind, he measured tide, he measured temperature of the water, he measured temperature of the air, and he made these recordings three times a day winter, spring, summer, and fall. And when he was out of town, Ann or the boys would go down to the river and make the measurements three times a day. And this record of Milwaukee weather is on file still at the University of Wisconsin. And it's a continuous record of rainfall, of snowfall, of tides. There is a tide. He discovered the tide on Lake Michigan. It's not very big, but there it is. And he wrote about it. Uh, and uh, about 10 years later, a, uh, an, an Eastern educated engineer of the U.S. Corps of Engineers said he discovered the tide and uh, increased at his numbers that were recorded 10, er, 10 years earlier to this man's boss 
a captain named Meade in Detroit, <laughs> and Meade saw immediately that increase had the same numbers as the captain 10 years later had, and settled the argument before Meade went to Gettysburg and won the Gettysburg, uh, the Battle of Gettysburg for the Union as a general in the Army. So they had a long correspondence on this. Meade was settling battles even earlier than he was in the war. Uh, so, a result of this is that Increase joined a growing number of amateur scientists, as he was, in proposing that we attempt to forecast storms, a storm warning system, because being on the shore of Lake Michigan, he was acutely aware of how suddenly a lethal storm would arrive from the west and turn over ships and lose, lose the ships, lose the crews, lose the treasures they carried. And they could be avoided if we had some way to move the information in front of the storm, which was just then becoming possible because of the telegraph. And people, people who had been corresponding about storms and weather in various places of the United States, Cincinnati, Louisville, Milwaukee, uh, Detroit, uh, uh, Dubuque, uh, they, were, they were talking about the weather and they had known from uh, uh, a, a very early meteorologist in the 1820s that weather in the northern hemisphere comes from the west and, and if you could move information faster than the storms were moving, you could warn and warn people and save lives. And that was that movement was well underway in the 1850s, but it was interrupted in the 1860s by the Civil War, and uh, and and uh, much as Increase uh, Lapham was trying to move it along, he could not uh, succeed. But after the war, the effort began again, and uh, in 1869, uh, he proposed, he wrote the bill that was introduced in Congress by the Milwaukee congressman, and it passed the Congress and was sent to President Grant, who signed it within days, and uh, ordered the Corps of Engineers to set up an office in Chicago which then hired Increase as its first forecaster. And Increase was getting information by wire from places west. And this is the first official weather forecast published in the United States in 1870, written by and distributed by Increase Lapham. And it predicts to observers along the lakes, bulletin this at once. A high wind all day yesterday at Cheyenne and Omaha. A very high wind reported this morning in Omaha, barometer falling, with high wind at Chicago and Milwaukee today. Barometer falling and thermometer rising at Chicago, Detroit, Toledo, Cleveland, Buffalo, and Rochester. High winds probable along the lakes. The story is that these flags went up in harbor areas that could be read by captains of vessels Vessels already at anchor in harbors stayed there. Vessels offshore that could see the flags ran for the harbors, and lives were saved, and ships were saved, and money was saved. And uh, Increase hated the office work, and in, several months later, he resigned from the company <laughs> storm warning system and went back to Milwaukee so he could collect fossils and plants. Should I go on? Uh very briefly on this. Briefly, Martha talked about the uh, about the the, uh, the Niagara Escarpment that and and the eastern edge of the Niagara Escarpment is Niagara Falls. That's the escarpment is a cliff. The eastern edge of a long of a, of a huge plate of limestone that lies 
about 600 feet down at the edge of Lake Michigan and uh, far deeper than that under the state of Michigan and out of sight. But it rises again in eastern Wisconsin and the escarpment, the western cliff of this dish-shaped rock formation is Door County, uh, Lake Winnebago, Horican Marsh, and then the western part of the Kettle Moraine in Milwaukee. And this has a very distinctive set of fossils. So when Increase stepped off the ship into Milwaukee and looked down on the beach, he picked up the same fossils that he had found as a boy of 16 east of Lockport in the Suez Canal, same rock formation, an enormous coincidence. How could it have happened this way? He picked it up and he decided to click and one of the first things he wrote in the first book published in Wisconsin in 1844 was, there is no coal in Wisconsin. He knew that from the minute he stepped ashore because he knew that the Silurian dolomite, the limestone, the Niagara limestone, was the youngest rock yet discovered in Wisconsin and that the coal fields of Illinois were even younger, so they hadn't occurred in Wisconsin. Wow. Wow. Uh, you do the, I can't remember. Okay. You want to move from this? So. Um, the Laphams had four grown children who lived to be adults. Um, the, These are five of them. This five, is four of them. Well, there, there are four of them here. Yeah. And one granddaughter here in the picture. At the end is Julia. Julia was the... Julia. Yeah. Julia is... Really? That yeah. one's Julia? This I is thought Mary. that was Mary. No, this is Mary. Oh, okay. This is Julia. I, I always thought it was the other way around. Anyway, Julia was really important to us and to all of us because she is the one who preserved her father's papers. They were in pretty good order when he died, but she typed at least 1,200 pages legal size of his letters and journals and important writings and intentionally gave over much of her life to preserving his, her father's papers, his knowledge, his reputation, and she did a great job of it. And then there was Mary, who became um, an archaeologist. Um, First president of the Wisconsin Archaeological Society. Right. Neither of them ever married. Seneca. This one's Seneca. That one's Seneca? Yeah. This is Charlie. Okay. <laughs> Charlie's the youngest. Yeah. And Charlie worked for the... Chicago, Milwaukee, and Right. St. Paul Railroad. He was an engineer like his father. Yeah. And he was the only one who had a long marriage and had children. Right. And he had one daughter, and this is she. And as far as we know, we lose track of them. We don't think that there are any dis living descendants of the Laphams. That we, we gave it a good shot. There may be out there. Maybe you know somebody. But we don't think there are any children. Um, and then there's Seneca. Seneca, the right. oldest son and the second oldest child. Yeah. But they had a wonderful family life and they were very close. They lived um, near the end of his life when he finally had a little bit of money, Increase Lapham gave them, bought a farm in a conwalk. And if you t do the next slide, I think we'll get okay. to that. Good. I think we'll get to that. Yeah. yeah. There we go. This is the Lapham farm on Lake Oconomowoc right here. Yeah. yeah. It's one of the last... Um, and this is the last map that Increase drove, drew, and he sent it out to his, his son and daughters who were living on the farm and said, sell this for a dime each to tourists. <laughs> <laughs> By this time, the Chicago, Milwaukee, and St. Paul came right north of uh, the lake uh -huh. and they could get off at O'Connell Walk and take a carriage to their house. He had a pretty good life because he'd take the train back and forth to Milwaukee and O'Connell Walk and, and uh, he'd see his, his children and then he'd go back to the city and by then and his wife had died for had several years earlier and that was a great sadness. But he had a um, pretty nice life there at the end and at the very end 
um, he, he finished a paper on the fishes of Oconomowoc Lake, uh, the possibility of um, fish of stocking the lake. He put the paper on his desk, straightened up the pages, as Paul always says, and took the rowboat out to the lake to go fishing. And he died of a heart attack out on Oconomowoc Lake on September 14, 1875. Can you imagine a better death for a man who was a naturalist? Just go out on the lake and die of a heart attack? I mean, and then they found him several hours later uh, Mary found him. Mary found him, yeah. And, um, and at the time of his death, he probably was the most respected man in Wisconsin. Yeah. He had taught me. We, we have only, we've just skimmed oh, the man. Yeah. He was an educator. He was a founder of the school that became Downer College. Um, he was a founder, it was called the Milwaukee Female Seminary. And it was important to him because he was a Quaker, that women get as good an education as men. And so Mary was one of its early graduates. He uh, knew his year. sons could go to Beloit College, yeah. but there was no place for his daughters to go to school. So he made it there be a school for his daughters. And it became Milwaukee Downer College, which was a famous female college. And then it was merged with Appleton that's part of uh, Lawrence University now. Mm -hmm. So you uh, and, and, and the papers that of, original, of the original Milwaukee Female Seminar, Seminary may be there. Uh, he was offered a chair at the Milwaukee F Female Seminary to teach there, but he turned them down on grounds that he had no college degree and therefore wasn't qualified. Oh, wow. <laughs> this was a guy who had given all the, really the first lectures on natural sciences in Milwaukee, in Wisconsin probably, and who did uh, amazing talks, and who wrote what Paul's going to read to you now. I'm going to, this is, I got on the internet. If you get on the lap of you become a cult figure. You, can't <laughs> think about it. Uh, you, you have to chase him down. So here I, I got on the internet after I read an article in, from a 1920s Wisconsin magazine of history that gave me the title of this book. I knew he'd written this book. I just didn't know the title of it, and I knew it wasn't under his byline, so I wouldn't find it yeah. at ABE Books. But I did find the title, and the title of this is Statistics Exhibiting the History, Climate, and Productions of the State of Wisconsin, prepared for the State Board of Immigration and published by order of the legislature. The governor had asked Lapham to do a book about the assets of Wisconsin to attract immigrants. Mm -hmm. And this book was translated into six European languages. Some of your ancestors may have read it and gotten their first taste of Wisconsin and come here because of it. If you are German especially, or Scandinavian, or Welsh, this is the book that they might have been lured to come to Wisconsin for. And on, he talks about the wonderful things of Wisconsin. Oh yeah, this is the very map I talked about. I found this book on the internet after I found the title of it. I bought it in an instant. And it, 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 this is the only place in the book where his name appears. A map of Wisconsin by I.A. A. Lapham, uh, Milwaukee. 1868. So here is what he says about Wapaka County in 1868. Not very much. You weren't very big at that time. Let me see if I can find it. This county contains 50,000 acres in, of improved land at an average price per acre of $10, 370,000 acres of unimproved land at an average price per acre of a dollar and a half. There are 22 post offices, 70 schoolhouses, 16 church buildings, 12 flouring mills, 10 sawmills, one woolen factory, two foundries and machine shops, one smelting furnace, and four other manufacturing establishments. Population in 1866 estimated 15,000, 
of which Wapaka has 1,500. So there you are. <laughs> and here he is, after he talks about the benefits of the state in prose, it will be seen by the preceding statement of facts and statistics based upon correct, usually official evidence that Wisconsin is a healthy state, a fertile state, a well-watered state, a well-wooded state, a rapidly growing state, a state where all the rights of man are respected, where intelligence and education are permanently secured for all future time, where all the necessities and most of the comfort, comforts and luxuries of life are easily accessible, where the climate is congenial to the health, vigor, and happiness of the people, and where the rains are duly distributed over the different seasons of the year, where agriculture, one of the chief sources of wealth to any nation, is conducted with profit and success, where the division of the products of labor between the laborer and the capitalist is equitably made, where the farmers are the owners of the land they cultivate, where honest labor always secures a competence for a man and his family, where land can be obtained almost without price, where every man has a voice in deciding the policy of the government under which he lives, where ample and proper provisions are made for the unfortunate, where every citizen is eligible to any office of the government. He made a mistake here. Immigrants can't be president. But other than that, he's yeah. right. <clears throat> Who, after reading this, would not want to come to Wisconsin? <laughs> Thank you.